info in that. I see more benefits in that. Um, we'll be able to focus on the, the central Yavapai area and really uh, be able to continue to support the town of Prescott Valley as they start their transit system. And then hopefully Prescott comes on board. Um, with that said, that was my main announcement, but I, I do wanna give the opportunity to Norm um, if there's any updates for uh, the town of Prescott Valley. I know I met with, with Pedro and uh, it seems that things are, are definitely moving forward in a very positive way. But Norm, did you wanna chime in and let us know uh, Prescott Valley Transit's uh, activities? Yeah, thank you, Vinny. Uh, just an update, you know, obviously the town is trying to capture as uh, directed by um, our town council, the three and a half million dollars of CARES Act funding for transit. So we're in the RFP process right now to develop the RFP scope to actually bring a micro transit provider to Prescott Valley. So um, we do have a timeline established, but basically we're in the RFP process now to uh, get it complete by the end of this month. And then we're uh, anticipating publishing that in September. So I look forward to we have a meeting in September just to give you an update what that status has been. But I guess uh, cut to the chase, if we can get the provider on board who that's going to be, we're probably looking into late spring of 22, actually having a micro transit system in place. That's the synopsis. Great, thank you very much, Norm. And, and again, I wanna remind the group, I, I think we're familiar, but sometimes we, we forget maybe we do have uh, Yavapai Regional Transit, who's operating out of the town of Chino Valley, but um, services the, the Quad City area or Tri-City area. And uh, maybe in the near future, I will extend an invite to, to Ron and Sherry to, to come and give us a, an update on uh, Yavapai Regional Transit's activities. But um, as we, we look to get Prescott on board, I want to acknowledge that Yavapai Regional Transit does uh, service and come into uh, the city of Prescott. So what we're looking to do is to to really get Prescott support to um, kick it up a notch. So uh, that's all, that's my updates at this point. Happy to take any uh, questions. No questions, we're good to go forward, Frank, when you're ready. Okay, thank you, Vinny. We'll move on to item seven, federal and state updates. Uh, first up is uh, ADOT LPA. Mark, have you got anything for us this, this month? There we go. Uh, Unmuted. I do have something this month. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, members of the Central Yavapai Planning Organization. Um, happy to uh, share with you uh, some upcoming items with local public agency at ADOT to help you with uh, possibly obtaining or working through federal aid funded projects. Um, first thing is uh, just an update or reminder, the standard specifications book, red book, um, ADOT updated and is in effect as of July 1st, 2021. So all projects being let for construction should be using the 2021 standard specifications, much thicker than the old one. Um, the other reminder is, I know this is a bit dated as well, but January, 2021, the roadway design uh, standard drawings were updated, so those are online. Uh, anybody using the ADOT roadway design standards. And um, moving along to my announcements, um, September 2nd is the next LPA uh, training. Uh, again, a while back, the process side of our local public agency section did a survey to all local agencies and COG MPOs, primarily the uh, non-MAG region uh, agencies, what were some items that uh, might need to be uh, discussed in the training opportunities. And they're up to module five on Thursday, um, September 2nd at 8 a.m. to 12. They'll be talking about clearances, environmental, right away, and utility. Um, that's a virtual meeting. So again, 8 a.m. September 2nd. Um, September 9th, 
Thursday at 10 a.m. I'll be bringing back the uh, Everyday Count Stakeholder Quarterly Meeting. I know, Frank, uh, you participated in that in the past. Hope uh, someone, yourself and other folks, Daniel Harmonick, possibly, uh, Vinny, of course, possibly, whoever uh, the reps are from your area. Um, for the During the pandemic here, the past year and a half, I kind of tabled that quarterly meeting and we move forward with the planning level estimate training series, part one, two, and three. And we shared how to uh, look up historical unit prices using ADOT database of E2C2 uh, to get realistic uh, unit bid prices and also how to do a PA or scoping for a pavement rehab was another training session. And the last part three, we did uh, uh, this past uh, March 2021, the HSIP applications, how to fill out an application. Um, but this now is not going to be open statewide. It'll go back to our stakeholder group, half planners, half engineers, talking about what's working, what's not working. And the topic for September 9th, again, it will not be a four-hour meeting. It'll be an hour and a half long meeting. Hopefully we get some traction and some good discussion with our ADOT project management group on pre-scoping meetings. We, we've talked for a year and a half of focusing on and peeling the onion of planning level estimating to get the right number in, you know, programmed up front. But after the program's done and you come a year or two later to initiate a project and you come to the ADOT LPA group to initiate and establish that federal aid project to go what I call from box one, the planning and programming box to box two development. We, we do a, a relook at that document of your application, of your estimate, of the backup documents, and we say, before we move forward, uh, we establish it and we say, look at the scope schedule budget, but after we establish it, we hand it over to a project manager who's gonna carry the baton, so to speak, in the spirit of the Olympics, uh, track and field, uh, to hire a consultant. And that's where we may run into some issues or challenges with costs being too high, and tasks not all being identified, or maybe changes in a field condition may have changed over the course of the, the last year or two before the funding became available to move the project from planning and programming to development. So the discussion isn't gonna be here today with me talking, it's gonna be with a panel of project managers with ADOT PMG Group, what they do with that baton or that project establishment in setting up a pre-scoping meeting before they hire the consultant and get the, what they call SOI, statement of interest. And we would revisit, is there enough funding programmed and planned to cover what project you all want to do? And that type of discussion I hope could maybe bring some innovation, some ideas, uh, maybe fix some things. Again, wishful thinking it maybe, but uh, trying to get some rubber to the road of how we can make some change uh, in delivering federal aid projects. So um, that is the topic for September 9th. The second topic to close out that hour and a half long meeting, it will be virtual, not in person, um, will be uh, Thomas O'Reilly. He's an in-house consultant who's a project manager to discuss uh, ADOT's experience with IDIQ, that's indefinite delivery, delivery indefinite quantity, similar to a JOC for ADA components uh, in the Yuma region. That project was completed last year. Tom had the brief presentation to give a lessons learned on that, another method of contracting. And with that, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you all and hope you all have a good day. If you've got any questions, happy to take them. Mr. Ma oh. uh, go ahead, Norm. Ask, ask away. Yep. Mark Wally Havy here. We have a discussion. I had a discussion with Vinny yesterday on just the fact of federally funded projects. We have some HSIP applications we're going to uh, have on the agenda. I think it's item number, um, geez, I don't know, number 10 on today's agenda. 
Question for you, Mark. There are small projects basically in the world of public works construction, you know, 600,000 to maybe a million and a half. Typically, federal funding is a one size fits all. You can do a 10 or $50 million project with the same overhead that you put on a small project. Go to directly my point. If it's federally funded HSIP, is the HERF exchange program still active to where if we make this recommendation to turn in HSIP applications, is that still active to where we could wash that money, so to speak, and not have to have the federal overburden on these small jobs that are less than a million and a half dollars? I appreciate your question, Norm. And I've asked the same question when we first reintroduced the HERF exchange. And unfortunately at this time, um, ADOT, um, the higher ranks here at ADOT have not made the de decision to be able to exchange highway safety improvement funds. Uh, I know a couple other states, uh, I asked the same question a few years ago when I caught wind that uh, Ohio was, was attempting to try that out. And we, were, we have not uh, been able to uh, get any uh, agreements to where we can exchange highway safety improvement funds. So. Well, thank you. I know Vinny and I had a long discussion yesterday because frustration is by history. We've all been doing this for a long time. Typically, as you say, the pre-scoping isn't right. Everybody gets frustrated because the project costs twice what it is and it takes 10 years to deliver a local project. So forgive me, I'm not beating on people. I'm just saying that's the data and history. Are we going to get better at what we do at the September meeting? That's my comment. Thank you. Well, again, it, uh, every day counts likes to... Uh likes to advertise innovation and um, I'm a coach and uh, I play engineer here trying to help locals uh, get the funding but I don't have a printer but I can uh, only bring change about if we have some dialogue and discussion with topics that matter and so after beating a drum uh, with how to do planning level estimates and share some of those tools with you all to think through these projects up front. Um, I do hope to get some traction with the project management group, communicating with the local agencies and um, identifying these tasks before they move forward into a contract, entering into a contract, hiring a consultant to d do the design of these federal aid projects. And uh, if there's an opportunity to uh, improve the system, um, that's the goal here. So. I hope there's some meaningful use to those that do attend, whether it be the planner side or the engineering side of what PMG is doing. And with that, there may be some solutions we can try to implement to create change. My best answer you know, to for the, today. Yeah, and to that point, Mark, you know, with our green light consultant doing our HSIP applications, my experience has been on smaller projects due to the overhead and burden. You know, they charge as much as 18% or more for the uh, construction management. That's okay if that's what it costs, but we need to get those identified up front so that when you say what the project costs, um, we're all good at what we do. We just need to make sure we get clear direction from ADOT that when you look at, it's easy to scope the, what the cost is of the project. What you need to do is make sure we get the overhead in for the construction management and the design in there and the federal burden of reporting. So that's in the estimate. Construction estimates are easy at what the work is in the field, but I would hope in September, we start identifying that. And I really like what I'm hearing from you, Mark, at the pre-scoping meeting, because our track record has not been very good. It's up to 10 years and more, and that's the minimum to deliver a local pro project with federal funding. And I hope we get better at it. Agree. Yeah, and if Thanks I can more. offer a comment, uh, Mark, also uh, backing up Norm, and uh, in, in definitely in full agreement, there's definitely uh, lots of frustration. I will applaud you mark you and your staff here in the last couple of years really acknowledging it i feel like we've had several statewide meetings and i am starting to see some real positive discussions i appreciate your openness mark to to holding these workshops um the the request of you at this point for us specifically for simpo you know if you're able to stay on the call when when mike uh, blankenship gives his presentation on hsip uh, again, we really want to work closely with you and the rest of ADOT staff. You know, Mike helped me out in Havasu the last couple of years, and we're, we're bringing him here to, to Simpo. But, you know, we are looking at advancing uh, for HSIP applications this year. 
Um, and one of the points that Norm brought up, and I share his concern, is you know this isn't till what fiscal years 25, 26, and the amount of things that can change between now and then, um, with the locals being fully aware that they're on the line for it. And well, Simpo's, you know, doing working with Mike to prepare those applications, scoping cost. You know, we we really need to set the locals up for success. And uh, to Norm's point, if this thing gets, you know, beyond not only four or five years out, but ten years out. Um, really poses a lot of a lot of issues, and and we've we've run into that with the HSIP program. Uh, we're grateful to to have the opportunity, but it can quickly turn to be a, a pretty big burden um, in in certain situations. So, um, thank you, Mark and uh, Mike. In a few agenda items, we'll be talking more about what our plans are, and and any input you have would be uh, really greatly appreciated. You bet. All right. Anybody else have any comments or questions for Mark? Okay. Uh, we'll move on to the ADOT Northwest District Office Report. Uh, John, the floor is yours. I have a, a few items um, on State Route 89. The Road 1 North intersection project is currently under construction. Uh, you'll you'll see that underway out there uh, with the traffic control and so on. Um, State Route 89 microseal project, uh, surface treatment project uh, north of Paulden up to Hell Canyon. That is still on schedule for the summer. Uh, the State Route 69 uh, Prescott Lakes to Heather Heights project is still in design. Uh, that's at stage three design. That project is still moving forward. Um, a side note uh, for for Simpo, the State Route 69 Spring Lane intersection project, that signal installation project is taking place this week. The signals are being installed and it's anticipated to be live next Tuesday, August 10th. Um, we also had a meeting yesterday, there, there was an update about the legislative funded transportation projects, um, identified a project to uh, do a pavement preservation on State Route 69 in Prescott Valley. The exact limits were not discussed, but that item is still out there. So that project could be getting developed here in the future. And another note, I did receive an email uh, this week. I was forwarded an email about the HSIP call for projects was going to be delayed. Um, the exact time frame on that was not identified. There seemed to be some question on the amount of funding that would be available. So uh, the note I had just said that the call for projects was going to be delayed. I did forward that over to Vinny um, so that we're aware of that, but I think we can just keep moving forward with the applications that we're discussing. Uh, they, they did not have a time frame for that. Thank you. Okay, um, John, I have a question. Has there been any official updates on the district engineer position that you could share? Um, I do not know an official update. The last word I heard was that the, the project has been advertised and closed and um, I guess applications are being reviewed. That's, that's about all I know. Okay, thank you. In case anybody uh, any other questions. For it. <laughs> yeah. And two, just a clarification, Frank, the update also that I heard is is it's a, I think they're advertised the position as a district administrator. Um, so I think they've, uh, if you will, opened it up from the district engineer um, title to a district administrator, allowing for, I believe, someone other than, than an engineer or uh, additionally, to be able to apply for that job. Yeah, I, I think they were trying to relax the requirement of the registration for that. And um, some of the documentation I saw had had both descriptions. It was described as district engineer, some described it as district administrator, some of them had a slash in between the two. So 
And then a quick qu question or comment, John. Um, I heard yesterday from ADOT staff that uh, the 69-169 uh, roundabout, um, the minor district funds were uh, approved for ADOT to move forward with. Is that correct language I can um, say? Yeah, correct. I, I apologize. I, I was reading through my notes of the meeting yesterday and, and uh, uh, accidentally overlooked that. It, it was identified, um, funded for design in fiscal year 22 and construction in fiscal year 23. Um, and we'll be, we'll be working on getting that started. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Anybody else have questions for John? Okay. Move on to um, ADOT Multimodal Planning Division. Uh, Myrna, do you have anything, any updates for us? Yes, hi. Um, I, oops, I seem to be, hello? Okay, good, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I do have a few uh, items to update the group. Um, as John Latier mentioned, the HSIP call for projects has been delayed. Um, I wanted to uh, expand a little bit on what Mark was uh, discussing earlier in terms of the cost estimates being um, possibly going out of date by the time the projects go into construction. So I kind of want to um, extend this out to the group in that uh, bag, the way they've been doing it in the past couple of years is they've been updating their estimates um, on an annual basis, applying a index so that at least the cost estimates are kept up with uh, the annual inflation per se, so that by the year the projects go into construction, basically the estimates would be in the dollars of the year of expenditure. Now that would be something that we could consider. Um, I will bring that up in Mark's meeting, um, I understand that the scope of projects between MAG and what would be built in the simple region would be drastically different as well in terms of scope. However, um, there is, we, you know, we could consider possibly, you know, revisiting those estimates on an annual basis so that at least they are kept up with the current years um, cost of construction. That would be the only way I can think of to keep those estimates up to date. Um, okay, so uh, next item would be the P2P workshops will begin in October. The exact dates will be determined um, and emails will be sent out. Um, my last item would be, there are three studies that are being conducted in FY22 at MPD. Uh, freight study will be um, conducted and basically an update of the previous one. Also rest area update of the 2011 study. And then the last one that's starting this year is a sign structure study. Uh, basically it's uh, prioritizing and standardizing um, sign structures that could possibly need to be replaced. So, and, and so that would be a statewide study. Uh, that's all my updates. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Just a quick comment, Mr. Chairman. Myrna, thank you so much for that idea as to what MAG is doing and, and reviewing those HSIP cost estimates annually from a staff standpoint. Uh, let me know if I can help you uh, um, ask ADOT of support for something like that. I think that's another way to stay on top of it. If we could review the cost every year and index it, I think that's a, a pretty great idea that we haven't had the opportunity to do in the past. So let me know how I can help with that. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? All right, we'll move on to item eight, title six, non-discrimination training, uh, Ms. Lucero. Yes, good morning. I'm gonna go ahead and present. 
right screen. Well, Joanna's bringing that up. If I can real quickly just uh, do a really quick introduction. So uh, Title VI is, as Joanna will take us through, the reason we're having this training is in receiving federal dollars. Um, there's laws in place and then also um, things to, to help us that, again, that to uh, make this uh, Title VI uh, in compliance. So SIMPO is reviewed every year um, for our compliance uh, through our Title VI document and activities. And under that umbrella is staff, the technical committee, executive board, and those that we work with. So um, this is uh, an annual opportunity, an annual opportunity to go through this uh, training. It'll be a brief training, but it is also incredibly valuable to our uh, compliance with uh, federal funds. So thank you, Joanna, for being here. Thank you, Vinny. And you guys can see the my PowerPoint? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Okay, so um, thank you for having me. So my name is Joanna Lucero and I work with the ADOT Civil Rights Office. Oops, sorry. Okay, so Title VI. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is where you know the law comes from. So it states that no person in the United States shall on the ground of race, color, or national origin be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. The items that are, the, the words that are bolded, I'm just gonna highlight, so person um, just implies it's regardless of citizenship status. Race, color, and national origin are the protected bases under Title VI. And then any program or activity means that it extends to any program or activity that receives even a dollar of federal dollars. And so the other like pertinent law is Civil Rights Restoration Act of 1987. And so through this act, through this act um, it made institution-wide scope and coverage of the non-discrimination statutes. So it made Title VI perhaps not, not, not just applicable to um, federal programs, but at that point, if your agency receives a federal dollar, the civil rights act should be applied institution-wide. And that would include all programs and activities of federal aid recipients, sub-recipients and contractors, regardless if the program is federally assisted or not. Um, however, when it comes to ADOT Civil Rights Office oversight, our oversight is only over the Federal Highway Administration um, programs or activities, or even Federal Transit Administration programs or activities. So what does Title VI ensure? Um, Title VI ensures that no person will be denied a service or benefit um, of, based on, the, on their race, color, national origin. Title VI ensures that a service or benefit will not be provided differently based on a person's race, color, national origin. And Title VI ensures that the enjoyment or privilege of a service or benefit will not be restricted based on a person's race, color, or national origin. Um, so if we see the, the picture, we want to, what we're trying to ensure is equity in our program. So equity ensures access to the same program, services, or activities, regardless of a person's race, color, or national origin. On the left, on the picture with um, equality, we see equalness, equalness. So we see the height in the stool that they're standing on is the same. However, the access to the tools is not the same. And so that's where on the picture on the right, we see equity, which is, different size stools, but at least, but they have the same access to the tools and are able to enjoy the same benefits. So we're, the goal is equity through Title VI. So um, this is connecting the dots, but this, all of these items that we see listed here, I'm not gonna go over all of them, but these are all the items that are, need to be included in the Title VI program. Um, one of the key ones is da data collection and analysis, and that's, important really just to ensure that title that non-discrimination is in fact not you know is happening that um there is no, no there aren't discriminatory there aren't potentially discriminatory um trends or patterns being identified and that comes from being able to collect data and then analyzing that data um we have all of the different items touching each other you know connecting the dots in essence because they all inter interlap over the other um, Data collection, 
An analysis can definitely be linked to enforcement and compliance. Program area reviews, that's where you're reviewing your program for potential, um, potential disparate in, um, impacts. So everything is connected. Ultimately, it's all part of the Title VI program and each one has their own important you know, features. So the Title VI implementation plan um, that Vinny mentioned a little bit earlier. So it's, it's con we consider it a living document because we do consider it to be added to all the time as, as, as often as needed. Um, it does need to be submitted annually. Um, and the other items that need to be submitted annually are in addition to the Title VI plan is a goals and accomplishment report. And the goals and accomplishment report is where the agency states what goal, what Title VI goals they have, what goals they have for their Title VI program, and then also what accomplishments they've been able to have in the previous year for the Title VI program, specifically around Title VI data collection, um, Title VI data reviews, or any um, training that was given or complaints that might have been received. Um, also, that what needs to be done annually is the assurances that need to be signed. Those are included with the implementation plan, but the assurances in essence are five, eight pages that list, excuse me, that list um, all of the all of the items that the agency, all the ways that the agency will not, will, will provide their programs in a non-discriminatory fashion. And that the agency is saying that, stating that they will provide their programs in a non-discriminatory fashion. So that's why the assurances are so important to be signed annually. And then also what needs to be done annually is a board approval of the Title VI plan. So um, we're highlighting this just because it's a big one and it's always a one that gets a lot of questions. Um, environmental justice is how we discuss and public and with public involvement. Um, so meaning for public involvement, it should be meaningful engagement methods um, for minority and low income populations. When we're talking about environmental justice, we're specifically talking about low income and minority populations, since those have been historically the least represented in um, federal projects. So when environmental justice and public involvement, we want to find a way to provide meaningful engagement methods for minority and low income populations. And that should be done by identification of where your low income and minority groups are, and then how Will your outreach methods specifically outreach to the low income and minority populations in your project area? And um, ideally, you would be providing more than one method for any member of your public to participate, meaning um, this is something we've seen a lot with virtual. So even if it's virtual, is there multiple ways to even access it? Not just like if I don't have computer access, is there a different way? And that can be done by adding a phone number. So that way there's two ways to access the meeting. Um, another important thing is to consider potential barriers that may exist for low income and minority groups in order to be able to participate and consider those before and see how, and in, in order to encourage minority and low income populations to participate in the transportation decision-making process ultimately. Um, so what does Title VI EJ and LEP compliance look like? So actually, I don't think I've mentioned what LEP is. So LEP stand in, is an acronym for limited English proficiency, which is in essence, anyone who speaks English less than very well. So um, not, or better yet, not speaking English is not a reason to not be able to participate. So um, if different languages are identified in your project area, then you should try and be inclusive with those um, populations as well, with those different languages. And that could be done by providing notices in multiple languages and giving outreach at that point in multiple languages as well. Excuse me. Excuse me, I'm not feeling well. I'm like very sick. <laughs> um, so I'm like all flustered. Um, so EJ and public involvement, some other examples of that would be with partnering with your local nonprofits and school districts in order to engage more with the, you know, the community and accessible meeting locations and times for potential populations of low income and minority populations. Um, Title VI and public involvement 
it's important that the, that the public is aware of what their rights are and the public has access to the transportation decision-making process. And again, that is done, there's, there's, a, there's no limit um, to how the agency can choose to you know, make their um, public meetings or really any, any part of the transportation decision-making process. We're not limiting that just to public meetings. It's, it's any information or anything that is part of the transportation decision-making process. And how is that inclusive to, um, to multiple different diverse um, populations, perhaps not the populations that maybe typically would come to a public meeting in a traditional sense, you know, in a, on a Wednesday, you know, at 5 p.m. or something. But, but trying different, different times even, uh, pro providing meetings at different times or at different locations, those are all different ways that can be inclusive to helping encourage low income or minority populations to participate. And so that's, I mean, that's it. I hope I didn't speak too fast, um, but this is our contact information for ADOT. And again, my name is Joanna Lucero, and I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Okay, uh, I guess you did good, no questions. <laughs> Thank you. Get well soon. Thank you. Um, all right, with that, we'll move on to item nine, review discussion and possible action to recommend approval of the fiscal year 2022 Title VI plan, limited English proficiency plan, and public involvement plan. Uh, Mr. Harmonic, they've got you on this one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, jo and with jo Joanna just going through some of the Title VI, it makes my job a little bit easier this morning. <laughs> uh, so we have our Title VI plan, and uh, obviously what, what that covers everything Joanna just uh, went through. Uh, the next plan that we have is, is our limited English proficiency and kind of what, what that entails for SIMPO and um, kind of how SIMPO would go about providing information if requested uh, by a member of the public that, that was LEP. Um, and then the final thing that we have that we, we have gone through this a little bit was the public involvement plan and kind of how members of the public can uh, become involved in our plan, such as our Metropolitan Transportation Improvement Program, our, our Regional Transportation Plan, our Coordinated Public Transit Human Services Transportation Plan, that is a mouthful, and our Unified Planning Work Program. Um, kind of on that, if there's any questions, I will take um, anything I can, and if not, then Allison would cover those. Mr. Chair, I got a question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so my question is: uh, Is this a um, is this in these plans that we've developed here? Have we had some semblance of these in the past? It's not. I'm not recalling these in the past. So. Uh, yes, we have had these in the past, and Allison or Vinny, maybe you guys can hop in there a little bit as well. These these are based on prior versions that we've approved in, through the past, correct? Yes. Are there have there been significant changes to them? Yeah, the there's been. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Allison. There's just a few updates um, that we've made, and they're minor. They're it's kind of just keeping up with the live document, like Joanna mentioned, making updates as we're made aware of them. Understood. That sounds good to me. Have we ever had to really implement these much? I, I guess, Dan, to me that the, the plan itself is implemented as it stands. It, it, have we had to, like have, we had to, exercise, have we had to exercise a, a complaint? No, we haven't received any, any complaints, sure. um, but the plan itself is, is implemented. It's fully implemented and in place. We just haven't had the, to exercise any discriminatory uh, accusation or, or issue at all. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Well, with that, I'm happy to make a motion to recommend approval to the of these to the board. Um, okay, is that? I guess are we are we ready for that, Dan? Or was that, did Allison have something to go over? Or? Nope, I think you're ready for the the vote for the action to move forward to the board. All right, Frank. Now that I'm caught up, so. All right, so I I'll, guess that's a motion that Dan made. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Norm with Prescott Valley. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair, Vice Chair Davis. Um, have a motion and a second. We'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah. Any opposed? Okay, sounds like the motion carries. And See, make sure I'm on the right item. Item 10, review and discussion possible action to identify projects to be included in the highway safety improvement the project or program, I guess, as long as it's a P, it works. Um, HSIP applications. Uh, Daniel, you want to lead this off? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, over the past couple months, we've been discussing with ATTAC and Mike Blankenship, who is on the, uh, the call today, and trying to identify projects in the area for uh, HSIP applications. Uh, what, we, what we've created so far is we on our list, um, we have four potential projects so far. We have Williamson Valley Road, uh, which would be a left turn lane at Sosinski Road. We have Gill Gardner Way and Fair Street, which would be installing a traffic signal. Um, in Prescott Valley, we have Lakeshore Drive, Papago Lane to, to Badger Road, which would be installing paved shoulders, pavement markings. Um, and then the last project that we just identified recently was on the SR69 uh, west of Walker Road um, and just east of Walker Road, right, right around the Costco area on the 69. Um, there's been a few fatal crashes, crashes that have involved um, uh, kind of crossing over lanes and, and dealing with head-on accidents. So we are looking at um, uh, adding uh, raised medians. And on that, Mike, is there anything else you'd like to kind of hop in on any of those projects? Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Uh, just a couple of things there on the first one, Williamson Valley Road, we, we did up that. Uh, and, and all of these are preliminary. Obviously, ADOT hasn't come out with the official call. Um, but you, based on the application uh, that they used in the past, uh, we've come up with these benefit cost ratios. So in uh, coordinating with Yavapai County, we did up the uh, cost estimate by $100,000 to 850000 for that left turn lane, still getting a nice BC ratio. And the last call for projects, the, the, the last project that actually received funding, so the project with the lowest BC ratio that still received funding was a 6.9 BC ratio. So anticipating it, it'll be similar in terms of the number of projects that, that get uh, funded and, and that are sent in for uh, applications. We're shooting to try to get a double digit, a 10 or higher BC ratio on these, thinking that that would compete favorably. And, and obviously all of these do. So Williamson Valley Road comes in at a 12. Um, um, Gail Gardner Way, the in, um, signal installation just under 11 for BC ratio. Norm's project there in Prescott Valley comes in with a very high 16.6. And, and with all of these, we do want to make sure uh, before the final applications uh, are submitted or the draft applications to ADOT for review that all of the local agencies are comfortable with those cost estimates. And, and I won't rehash what you guys have already gone through, but, but it's very important. And then uh, just recently here in coordinating with ADOT Northwest District, that last one there, and we'll probably need to update the, the title there because it's really not widening to six lanes. The, the widening will be um, just east of Walker Road where it uh, starts narrowing down from three lanes eastbound to two. There's been some uh, some issues there where it merges down to two. So it would, it would widen that third outside lane and keep three lanes for another, oh, it's about another four tenths of a mile or so of widening, but just in the one direction eastbound. And then uh, putting in raised medians, basically from Lee Road, which is the signalized intersection west of Walker, uh, where the two-way two left turn lane is there uh, heading into to the intersection with Lee Road and putting in uh, raised medians 
throughout that segment there, again, to about four tenths of a mile east of, of Walker Road, where there's two way left turn lane, obviously not where there's uh, um, individual left turn lanes there. And we're showing two BC ratios and two cost estimates for that last project there with ADOT. Um, the million would be for a basic um, six inch raised median. The 1.3 million would be if ADOT was interested in putting, they're calling a low profile median barrier, but the higher barrier, um, similar to what they've uh, used in the past over there. But either way, th that project there on 69, again, is coming in with a pretty favorable BC ratio. And the other thing we try to do here was kind of spread, spread the wealth. So you've got the county, ADOT, Prescott Valley, and City of Prescott uh, hopefully receiving projects out of this. Um, we did look at a location over there in, in Dewey Humboldt, and I know that's, that's – um, um, well, it was on 69th intersection with Kloss. There has been a fatal and a serious injury crash coming off the side street there on the east. And in discussions with ADOT, um, that one is not in the access management plan and there's really nothing um, that, that could be put into an HSIP application now, but ADOT is definitely willing to, to have discussions and work with Dewey Humboldt on, on some other types of, of uh, modifications there, whether it's uh, limiting some of the access in and out of that intersection or what it might be. So I guess with that, I'd kind of open up to see if there's any questions, comments. I, I have a, uh, just wanted to thank you for having the look into that. This is John Hughes for Dewey. Just wanted to thank you again for looking into that for us to keep it on the radar in the future. Uh, Mike, uh, is there any need for uh, um local match on the uh, the 69 project or not? Is that fully covered? There, there would be local match, but it, it would be ADOT. And I think ADOT in the past has just used HSIP as their match, I think. I could be wrong on that, but but you're correct, Dan. There would be local match. The only reason I ask is we've, you know, had often had uh, IGAs for other improvements uh, with other local agencies in the Simpo region for, uh, you know, trying to help these things along. I didn't know if that was something that that might come up or might be considered uh, uh, for this one, so. Yeah, and I will double check on that, Dan, but I, I think um, at least in terms of non-ADOT local match, I think we're good on that one, but, but I'll double check. Mike, this is John. Um, just a, a thought on that on that naming for that stay route 69 where you, you mentioned widened to six lanes. Um, maybe that could, could be described as a extend acceleration lane or something like that. Yeah, yep, I agree. I like that. Okay, and I see uh, Vice Chair Davis, you got your hand raised. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I had to leave, but I just, I, I got a 10 o'clock I got, can't get out of. Uh, just wanted to comment on this item. My recommendation to be as a tech, we should recommend on uh, the priority of, on the BC ratio uh, so that, you know, if it gets massaged later by the electeds on, you know, political, that's okay. But I think as a tech, we ought to recommend them in priority according to BC ratio. And uh, my other question too is uh, just want to comment, how much money is available? I know they've delayed the funding, but do we know the aggregate amount statewide? Norm, typically it's about 35 million per year. So for this two year, cycle of fiscal 25 26 there should be approximately 70 million again that could change and 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 i think it could change typically it, it it might drop a little but i think it could actually go up based on the infrastructure bill that's that's uh, working its way through um congress now because they have up the amounts for safety if that bill does pass. And I think that might trickle down to the HSIP programs also. But pit, typically it's been about 35 million a year. Mike, am I understanding, what's the maximum dollar amount you can turn in for a project? Five million, five million? max, five million max, 250,000 minimum. Thank you. Yep. I gotta go guys, thanks for your time today. Thank you, Norm. Um, and just to follow up a little bit on that, Mike, as far as recommending projects, I think BC ratio is a good idea, but as far as how it works with the state, do we just submit them and they 
they just kind of go in the pot, so to speak, and the committees rank those, or does any recommendations come in to factor in that? Is that, am I asking the right way? Yeah, if, if I understand you, Frank, it's uh, recommendations don't impact once it gets to ADOT. It'll it'll be ranked uh, based solely on the BC ratio. But I think if I understood Norm correctly, maybe he was thinking if if for whatever reason Simpo or the or your executive board decides to only go after three out of these four, maybe it's the ranking there from the region before you submit them. Per that that sounds great. I appreciate that. So. Uh... Yeah, that would that makes sense to me. So, okay, and I have a, a question for you, Mike. On it maybe not directly related to Lakeshore, but it, it made me question maybe what we think of when we're looking at our local pavements. Um, as far as shoulder width, does the width of the shoulder when you look at these does that have an effect of the the, the benefit or the safety? improvements as far as does a wider shoulder give you a better rating or does it depend on speed or do you know off the top of your head? Uh, so the short answer is yes. So a wider shoulder in general, you're going to get a, a higher crash reduction factor. So the benefit would go up. However, a wider, adding a wider shoulder, your cost is going to go up. So, so there, there'd be some trade-offs there that, that we'd have to look at, but you're right. In general, a wider shoulder is a safer shoulder. Okay. And I can just kind of research those reduction factors to, for whatever project we're looking at. So, all right. Thank you. Um, any <laughs> other questions? Um, Mark and I got a couple comments and questions. Uh, okay, go ahead, Mark. Thought if you, um, Again, in, in my, with, with regard to the funding for the HSIP, that's uh, temporarily delayed right now for the call. We were expecting to have a workshop uh, in July, but uh, there's been some discussions at a high level here internally at ADOT. Why be, uh, with HSIP? Because oftentimes we see a number of 850,000 and I'm not going to pick on these projects there. I'm sure Mike's done great research. And this is the starting point or i.e. the problem statement in a sense. Um, and then when the project progresses along into development and we identify additional costs are needed, um, they try to allocate all of the funding that they have with traffic safety for that particular year. And this is going to be 25 and 26. So something that far out, some of the discussions with ADOT project management group is they would use a 3% per year inflation factor. Now to say ADOT told me to use 3% per year, that may get you there, it, it, it may not. Bids have been coming in higher on these lessons learned in 21 was many of the projects were coming in higher than originally programmed and so traffic safety tries to hold back a small percentage of the 70,000 or 35 per year to be able to bail out, so to speak, some of these projects if they can. And it seems to be more of a challenge each and every year. I'll just say it that way. So this is great work that Mike has put together. And I, I was just poking at it a little bit because I know traffic safety is going to review these estimates and these applications. I would say definitely include the type of roadway or, you know, the functional class. I know you typically do, Mike. But my thought is that if any one of these four projects do not get selected, is there an opportunity since there has been identified as safety needs to maybe follow up as a HERF exchange in the future, outcoming years, one thing. And again, understanding the functional class and more about the project, meaning uh, you're gonna construct a left turn lane at Williamson Valley. I had to recommend taking a close look, uh, or Mike, does that 850 include design and construction with all the clearances? Or was there potentially some other issues? I know a number of of add widened shoulder rumble strip projects that were low dollar projects 
but we get into the design and there was no funding there to extend the many pipes that needed to be extended with the shoulder widening. And so, uh, again, this is a, a great problem statement, but what gets selected and programmed four years from now, will we be able to move forward to design and construct it are the questions that I really want to ask the, the, the TAC member agencies in these areas to, to help Mike or to give the comment. Uh, we want it to be successful. And these are just some lessons learned and some thoughts. So my apologies. Uh, I went, went too long. No, th th those are great points, Mark. And, and in fact, you, you mentioned uh, extending culverts. So that was one of the s discussions with ADOT on this uh, potential project there on 69, because there is a culvert nearby, but uh, it looks like it's probably just outside of excuse me, the limits of this project. So yes, we, we will be working closely with the locals, but also closely with you and, and your uh, folks there, Mark, in LPA and obviously traffic safety, so that we can come up with some better um, cost estimates for these applications. These, these uh, planning level cost estimates here did include um, design and clearances and, and ADOT admin, but obviously we'll be taking a closer look at each one of these as we put the application together. Sounds good, Mike, thank you. A comment from the city of Prescott, Ian couldn't be with us, but he did submit an email. Um, again, city of Prescott's fully in support of the, uh, the project as lifted, especially the Gail Gardner traffic signal. Uh, Mike, he wanted to also let you know that um, they're doing a, um, a warrant study uh, for that traffic signal. It's not uh, currently done, but it's it's scheduled to be done later this month. Um, yeah, with the application, okay. Yeah, I, I actually meant to ask about that because I know they were talking about doing one. And yes, ADOT traffic safety will require that. It, if it does not meet traffic signal warrants, this application will not be uh, selected for, for funding. But it sounded like uh, Ian thought that he was pretty sure it would meet uh, warrants. So yes, it is dependent on meeting signal warrants. Okay, any other discussion? Okay, um, so Daniel or Vinny, uh, help me with, with action. Should we recommend uh, forwarding this to the executive board or is that what we're looking for here? members of the TAC. Um, my, my recommendation, my preference, and I'm open to a discussion on this, but my preference would be that uh, these are the, the recommended choices by the technical committee uh, at which Mike will begin working on the applications once ADOT announces um, the criteria, once they open that call for projects what I will be doing is sharing with the executive board um, uh, how we're moving forward with the project. Um, if, if you would like an approval by the executive board, there wasn't, I wasn't intending on doing that necessarily, but I'm more than happy to take a recommendation by the TAC. Um, I was just going to update the executive board on these uh, projects moving forward, but um, if you would feel more comfortable recommending to the executive board for their review and then seeking their approval, um, we can do that. At this point, I was looking to give Mike some thumbs up so that he can start working on the applications. But okay, Mr. No, Chairman, just, just asking, Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead, Mark. And one more question, uh, Mike, I just apologize again for interrupting, but uh, did you have any contingency in there? And if so, what may have been the percentage? Because I know at, at PMG, they've been, they've been using 30% on some of these uh, problem statement type projects where you don't have a lot of detail up front. And I don't know if you've got any contingency at all, just a, a thought that might be 
valuable to the local. Yeah, Mark, and, and we went with, um, so ADOT's HSIP application uh, has specific call outs for um, above the line, below the line cost estimates. And I wanna say they have 25% in there. I'd have to go back and check it, but but we're, we're definitely very mindful of uh, cost overruns and making sure that these cost estimates are, are coming in, um, you know, conservative on the high side if we have to err. And then Mr. Chair, I think Norm had a question or comment and then Dan also does. I think Norm had another meeting to go to. Uh, he did, but then I heard his voice. I don't know if he... Norm, are you there? Hey, I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble hearing. Um, okay. I'm to speak. I heard Norm, but Dan, you had a question or comment? Yeah, um, Vinny, your your mic is uh, kind of acting a little weird. I don't know if others are hearing it, but uh, I think that uh, that's what Mark, or uh, sorry, Frank was alluding to. <clears throat> My question is, um, is do we need to make some for take some formal action with regards to agreement on applying for a fourth application um, since I believe, if please correct me if I'm wrong, I think the scope with the uh, green light originally had three applications. Now I was switching earbuds um, and I didn't hear the beginning part of your question. Sorry, Sorry about that. Uh, the, uh, I think our scope with uh, the contract with uh, green light and Mike um, originally had three applications. So do we need to consider um, taking some formal action if we're interested in uh, in doing four. Yeah, let, let's uh, thank you actually for that, Dan. My, my approach prior to your comment was gonna be to just administratively go ahead and adjust the contract to go ahead and expand it for a fourth application. It's such a, a, a small dollar amount that I didn't see an issue, but it'll be helpful to have that as part of the recommendation action i agree um i think that's an appropriate uh, way we clearly have four projects that all seem quite viable and of course um you know there's a little bit of a question about the the intersection at gail gardner and fair street meeting lawrence but it sounds like ian had some level of confidence so my opinion is we move forward on that so i guess my my thought is uh, if you can administratively add uh, fourth uh, application as uh, um, predicated in the contract. I'm supportive of that. If you feel that would be better to have a, a vote on that uh, uh, for your own benefit, Vinny, I'm, I'm even happy to make that motion, so. Um, I would accept that. And then also, Dan, will you please offer comments and, and other TAC members? Um, again, I, I will definitely update the executive board as to these choices, but I'm more than happy if you think the, the politics warrant uh, asking the board for their approval or is simply letting them know that we are moving forward in progress. You, you, you all know your respective electeds best. Do they uh, want to just be updated or do they want to approve this list? My, my gut says that they are um, probably more interested in just giving, getting updated and knowing that things are proceeding as planned under the contract with the minor adjustment. That's my opinion. And, and that's my opinion too, Dan, but if, the, if there's anyone else, please offer comments, but that was my intent at this point, so. All right, Dan, I think the action's for you to, to lead us with the recommendation. All right, I'm okay. happy to uh, just make a motion uh, to um, have the uh, administrator, simple administrator, um, make a, uh, a minor uh, contract adjustment to add, uh, I think it was an additional $5,000 uh, uh, cost for um, adding a fourth application for HSIP. Uh, so that our contractor knows kind of what direction he's going. I'll second that, John Hughes Dewey. Okay. 
Thank you for that. We have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Does that give you enough direction on that, Vinny? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. And, and I will just note on closing that for those interested, I know as far as Chino Valley, there weren't too many projects or any on this list, but if in the in the backup data in the packet, I think there's three projects ADOT's already received funding for um, on Highway 89 up north of Chino. So that that's where some of that has already been taken care of through ADOT. So uh, thank you. I want to thank ADOT for Chino <laughs> Valley for that. Um, and we'll move forward. I believe we're on item 11, review, discussion, and possible action to appoint a TAC liaison to the Ecosystem Connectivity Mitigation Advisory Committee, EMAC. So back to you, Vinny. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the TAC. Um, in, in returning back to SIMPO and evaluating the various projects, committees, functions, and so forth, um, in reviewing the, the Ecosystem Connectivity Mitigation Advisory Committee or the EMAC, um, uh, definitely a, a desire, especially on their end. And just a reminder that this is an advisory group under the technical committee. So this is a group that uh, provides a review of projects and then gives recommendations to this particular body um, as it relates to the, the ecosystem. Um, in, in talking with that group, again, there, there's a real passion, eagerness to be actively involved. Um, it, it's a, a group that wants to, to have a voice and be able to review projects and um, looking at uh, maybe ways to improve the engagement. Uh, a suggestion that I have at this point is to have a, a liaison uh, that's one of the current TAC members uh, be able to uh, attend uh, the EMAC meetings. Um, as they're scheduled at this point, they are meeting quarterly. So they're only meeting four times a year. I know everyone's schedules are busy, but I would be looking for one of the TAC members to uh, step up today uh, to be able to attend those meetings. And again, the, the intent here is a greater connection between the, the TAC and their advisory group, the EMAC, um, uh, better uh, project communication, and ultimately um, better effectiveness of the EMAC. You know, we, we after the retreat, should have some projects, uh, very specific planning projects that uh, we would be engaging the EMAC for their review and, and recommendations. But I, I really believe it would greatly help um, both the TAC, EMAC, and the overall SIMPO uh, organization if there was a liaison um, that was a TAC member um, working with the, the EMAC group, attending the meetings, uh, attempting to provide communication also back to the TAC. So some of the, the areas of, of concern were communication and engagement. And I think this is a, a solution. Um, I will say um, there was a recent uh, EMAC meeting and on the way there, I, I quickly asked uh, Dan Cherry if he was available to attend the meeting um, again as a TAC member and, and just help me, uh, you know, be able to offer some, some guidance and support to the EMAC group. Um, so Dan did attend the last EMAC meeting, very appreciative of that. Um, on behalf of the EMAC, I, I think they felt, um, again, part of the process engaged. Uh, Dan was able to offer some, some technical perspectives, um, not only from uh, Yavapai County, but uh, the work that SIMPO has been doing and, and could be doing in the near future. So uh, Dan, um, if you will, served as uh, the liaison at the last meeting, but Mr. Chair moving forward uh, would be looking to, to uh, have a formal action uh, for one of the TAC members to serve as a liaison um, for all future meetings. Um, so if we can have that discussion and action, that would be helpful. Okay. Um, 
I'd like to just open it up for discussion if anybody has any thoughts on how we should do this, if it should rotate or... Um. Well, uh, I'll say, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that uh, I don't mind uh, serving in that role for probably the next couple of years if you'd like me to, um, at least until my chair duties rotate back up. So you can provide a little bit of continuity and uh, um, I don't know that it necessarily needs to rotate annually like our uh, like our chair and vice chair duties do. But my opinion is uh, um, I think there's, I think Vinny's ideas are excellent. I think uh, having some um, presence there uh, by a TAC member in the EMAC meetings is of great value. Uh, I do think it helps um, our chair for the EMAC, uh, Tammy DeWitt, uh, just kind of um, keep discussions moving and, uh, and, and you know, technically they do report to us. So having some presence in that respect is of tremendous value. So um, if you would just if the uh, TAC would just like to go ahead and make a motion to formally uh, appoint me as that liaison for, you know, the rest of this calendar year and uh, and next calendar year, I, I I don't object. Okay, and uh, Dan, my my recommendation would be after maybe that term that we look at this position. At the same time that we look at the the other positions, the chair and vice chair, revisit it. Then, what do you think? That's fine. All right. Uh, this is John. I got a, a question for Vinny. Um, can you discuss uh, maybe elaborate a little bit? You said that there were specific planning projects to be reviewed by EMAC. Um, I know I I said in on on a one of those, at least one of those meetings, a, might have been a year or two ago, um, when the State Route 69 widening the Presca Lakes to Heather Heights project was was getting moving. Uh, there was some discussion of that with the EMAC. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on on the the level of projects they would review and and the participation or the feedback that they provide? Like what yes. kind of what's expected of that? You bet. Thank you, uh, and Mr. Chair and John. Uh, good question, uh, and I'll respond to it. So that would be a good example moving forward. And at the retreat, we're going to be talking about our next five years worth of projects, of planning projects, at which we'll be looking at the uh, Sundog Connector Great Western 69 Master uh, Corridor Study and 89A and 89 studies. Um, so, John, in the context of those in particular, um, we'll use Sundog Connector and Great Western as examples. Um, what, what Dan and I attempted to do at the last meeting, or, or trying to do, encourage them, number one, is, is knowing that these projects are, are, are coming soon, some sooner than, than later. You know, we, number one, wanted to get them started on established studies for both Sundog Connector and Great Western, get familiar with those particular projects. Um, if, if Sundog Connector ends up being our next uh, major planning uh, priority, um, then again, their, their work will, will be ground level up as to what, what aspects might um, intersect with their, their focus of, again, the, the ecosystem, the connectivity, the wildlife uh, mitigation. So they, they would be able to uh, begin their recommendations to you as a TAC, you know, what, what in the planning study and the scope of study uh, is reasonable um, uh, request from them, a recommendation to you as a technical committee uh, for the, the planning studies moving forward, how much um, environmental or uh, wildlife mitigation can we Put in the scope. What are you comfortable with recommending? Um, what what are things that we might be able to look at? You know, I think looking at 69, um, you know, there were discussions as to wildlife overpass and and uh, crossings both above and under under the road. Uh, as I understand some of those discussions, you know, it seemed as though their uh, engagement was a little bit later in the process. Number one. 
But then number two, clearly there's always a, a cost issue. These are high, high cost um, propositions. So another part of their process, John, or, or of their role is to also seek out uh, funding opportunities uh, that that may uh, be that could be part of these projects, federal, state, public, private partnerships. But bottom line is they they would be recommending to you as a TAC, um, whether it's part of the planning study or the implementation of the project. But um, I would say that's that that's my response. Does that make sense, or do you have further questions? No, oh, th thank you. I appreciate that. I, I just wanted, I thought it would maybe help to discuss that, clarify a little bit of, of that expectation and, and participation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like that idea of getting in, involved a little bit sooner, like with the planning projects. Like you said, the, the issues on State Route 69 kind of came up later in the development. And, and uh, like you said, there were some, some pretty, pretty high cost alternatives identified. So um, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other discussion? Uh, with that, uh, I think I'll go ahead and take the lead and uh, Make a motion that we appoint uh, Member Cherry as a liaison for the EMAC committee for the remainder of this calendar year and next calendar year. And then the position will be revisited in subsequent years at the same time that the other positions for the TAC are uh, looked at. I'll second that. Okay. I have a motion and a second. Um, any other discussion? Okay. Call for a vote. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? All right. And I uh, want to thank you, uh, Dan, for, for stepping up on that. I know, like the rest of us, your time is in very short supply, so... Uh, it's it's not a small thing you're doing there, so I appreciate it for the other members of the TAC. Thanks, Frank. I, I appreciate that. I figure it's uh, it's all part of the same goals here that we all have, so I, I don't mind. And Dan, having sat in on those previous meetings for 69, if you ever needed any backup or help, let me know. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so I think with that, we can move on to item 12, review discussion and possible action to recommend approval of the RTAC priority projects for the SIMPO region. Back to you, Vinny. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the TAC. Just a, a heads up, I, I'm gonna just talk about this briefly, but I am gonna recommend that the action be tabled for it and that we actually move this item to the September agenda and I'll explain here in just a moment for that. Um, with that in mind, um, my first week back at SIMPO, this was a discussion. Again, reminder to the group, um, we are working with our advocacy arm, if you will, Rural Transportation Advocacy Council, and um, the, the 10 MPOs and COGS that are in greater Arizona, basically outside Phoenix and Tucson, uh, work through RTAC for advocacy on a, on a state level and on a federal level. Um, with that said, uh, the, the MPO COG um, directors and then also their respective RTAC board members have uh, all agreed to, to go after one-time funding for Greater Arizona in the next state uh, legislative cycle. Uh, the dollar amount that we have set is $50 million. Um, if you remember from um, Kevin Adams' previous updates and maybe my updates, um, this past year, uh, there was uh, one-time transportation funding, um, a little over $300 million that uh, the state legislature went after uh, individual projects. Um, John Latier mentioned one of them um, that is out in the uh, town of Prescott Valley 
um, that was that is awarded four point seven million dollars for that project. Um, that's an example of one-time funding projects. That four point seven is part of again over three hundred million dollars worth of projects. Um, number one, we're, we're grateful for any monies that come into our region. So that's the biggest point. But number two, um, the legislative process um, can definitely work around the work that you all do um, as staff, the work that we do as staff. So we would like to work better with our state legislature. And we think that this is one way of doing it. This doesn't at all uh, prohibit them from identifying projects like 69 in Prescott Valley, they can still pursue that. But what we would like to say is uh, we have identified real uh, priority projects in our regions. And um, of those projects, we would like to see them funded. Um, if successfully awarded the $50 million to Greater Arizona, it'll be divided based upon population. Uh, Simpo would then receive um, just under $4 million. Uh, for the sake of this conversation, I'll just call it $4 million. And uh, that one-time funding, again, will be state funding. Uh, the, the recommendation started with you um, at the March uh, 11th TAC meeting. At that meeting, you identified the number one project, if awarded these funds, should be the 69-169 roundabout. Um, as John and I mentioned earlier, um, ADOT um, has been uh, able to uh, receive their minor district funds. And at that time, I asked you if that was the case, because that was looking optimistic, what your plan B was. Uh, your plan B that you identified uh, to me at that point was um, the State Route 89A on-ramp um, uh, construction. A uh, reminder, we are currently doing that planning study as we speak, so we don't know the, the final recommendation, but the uh, regional transportation plan does estimate uh, a solution to that on ramps at around two and a half million dollars. So we penciled in that amount um, as if we were to receive the four million, that two and a half million would be uh, um, identified for the 89A on ramps at the intersection of 89 and 89A. Um, the remaining balance, um, you all at the time mentioned that the uh, adaptive traffic signal project um, was currently happening and that um, the remaining dollars could go towards the implementation of it. Um, Again, that study is still in process. I don't want to um, jump too far ahead, but there's a sense that um, the, the implementation um, may not be as great as what we thought when we started it, um, that um, Burgess and Nipel and working with the, the three entities where uh, the traffic signals fall under uh, 69 with ADOT, Glassford with uh, Prescott Valley, and Willow Creek with Prescott, it, it just doesn't seem like there's gonna be a, a lot of movement for regional uh, implementation and support. So um, what I'm saying is, is there still, if, if in fact, and this will be at the September meeting is what I'll be looking for, uh, your primary discussion and action. If in fact you as a, as a technical group decide that the adaptive traffic signals is no longer a regional priority project and the locals will be moving forward that then again leaves open that almost 1.5 million dollars uh, one of the primary reasons i'm now asking to, to table this is we have a retreat on wednesday and i i my intent and my hope is is as staff presents our next five years of, pri of planning priority projects. Out of that discussion, you'll, I'm hoping that you'll be able to see a, an area to be able to identify uh, that $1.5 million. So uh, happy to take questions and comments right now, but I would ask um, that the, the TAC table an action on this one and um, allow the retreat discussion with you, the board and staff to play out. 
And then at your September meeting, I will then uh, make a recommendation for that one and a half million dollar one-time funding based upon the retreat discussion. So again, happy to take questions and comments, but I would ask Mr. Chair if we could table the action on this item today. And John has his hand up too. Okay. Yeah, Vinny, I, I just I wanted to ask the question if if you identified, you know, you mentioned the the 69 roundabout as the number one priority identified. If there were to be some funding available through that one time um, funding pursuit, uh, would it be reasonable to maybe consider some of that funding still for the roundabout if it were to be needed? Um, I know looking at the budget that was identified with that district minor, um, I, I think if I'm just wondering if it would if it would still be possible to try to have something available for local participation if it were needed. My my immediate answer, John, would be yes. Um, what I would ask of you would be for the September uh, TAC meeting um, to bring back some additional information if in fact you, you believe that is a possibility, you know, and let, let's present that to this TAC and say, you know, what, what are the dollar amounts for the project as it stands? What is the award amount? And again, what, what might be a reasonable request? But again, to me, that still remains the, the number one project for, for the region. So um, to me, it would be a, a discussion to have and then the TAC make a decision as to um, being able to still set aside some money for them. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or discussion? Okay. I'd be open for a motion at this point if anyone would want to forward a motion to. I'll motion to table it, but I don't know that you need that. Oh, do I need a, just to table it? I can do that. So. Help me out here. You can do that with, with your chair authority and power. Okay. All right. Then, uh, yeah, if, if everyone sounds like everyone's in agreement, so I will uh, act to table this until the next meeting so we can have that discussion at the, at the retreat. I, I think, I think a lot can come out of that retreat and, and with, you know, political changes in the area lately and whatnot, I, I think it'd be smart to be patient on this. So. All right, is that good enough for what you need, Vinny? That's good enough for me, Frank, thank you. Okay, all right, I believe next item is 13, agency announcements and updates. Um, I'll just go ahead and go down the list. I'll, I'll just start uh, real quick, Chino Valley, uh, we're like everyone else, we're really busy. Um, we did get a, a local project on 2 North by Safeway. It's all complete, but final striping. Uh, that project somehow managed to wind up a month ahead of schedule. I don't ever uh, guarantee that I can, the town can do that again, but um, there's a big benefit to get that project done before school opened, especially with uh, the ADOT job of One North, it was when both projects were open up for a little bit, it was getting interesting with traffic around here. So um, but that's open. We've got a lot of other projects going on um, and still dealing with COVID issues. No news on any changes as far as local lobby hours or anything other than I would let folks know it's always subject to change. So uh, with that, uh, we'll move down a little bit, um, see if uh, Norm is back or wants to provide any comments from Prescott Valley. Okay, 
think he had to drop off. Uh, we'll move down the list. Mr. Hughes, anything with uh, Dewey Humboldt? Um, just uh, road maintenance from the flooding, but other than that, we're kind of quiet at this time. I appreciate everybody for uh, doing the things that they do, and um, yeah, we're we're kind of humbled and quiet right now in, in Dewey. Okay. And is Ian Ian's not here, so we'll move down to to the county. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, few updates from us. We've got storm cleanup going on all over the county right now. It's, you know, it's been a pretty good monsoon season so far. I, it's been a little hot the last couple of days, but I'm hoping the rain comes back. Uh, but uh, it's kept us busy. You pretty much had to drop most everything else we had going on with our roads crews and First get roads open and now we're just kind of cleaning out ditches that are full of sediment and uh, you know opening up pipes and whatnot so it's uh, progress there. I've got a couple projects in the area that are ongoing as far as construction. One is our phase three of our Williamson Valley Road safety improvements that is uh, adding turn lanes and improving site distance at uh, the intersection of Williamson Valley Road and Kelly and O'Neill and Stringfield. And uh, so that is uh, um, ongoing. I expect it'll go at least another couple months. We uh, milled up the existing pavement this week and we've been hauling a lot of material out there right now as we're lowering the roadway about three feet for improved site distance. It's kind of at the crest of a hill at this point. Uh, not in the simple region, but we've got a project up on Drake Road near the cement plant where we're doing some paving there that is uh, I think poised to start paving this week uh, if everything goes well. Um, and then we are, uh, um, we're probably in September, I think. We're working on uh, finalizing the scope right now uh, with green light actually um, to do a safety study of some of our regionally significant roads. And uh, that'll include uh, kind of a assessment of some major corridors, most importantly is Iron Springs Road uh, for its full length, but also uh, a portion of Williamson Valley Road between the city boundary and Pioneer Parkway, uh, the full length of Pioneer Parkway, and then also uh, the majority of uh, Cornville Road over in the Verde Valley. So that's uh, anticipated to be an important project for us uh, in going forward with regards to assessing safety and planning out uh, where we can uh, um, program some funding in the future uh, after that's completed. Uh, um, kind of hits on my high points, so I'll yield the floor. Okay, and um, Myrna, I wanna give you a second chance for anything ADOT related. I know you already spoke, but. Um, I think I'm, I'm good. I don't have any further updates, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, John, anything you might have missed or need to mention? Yeah, I'll, I'll add a couple. We, we do have, um, you know, if I heard um, uh, Dewey Humboldt and, and Yavapai County discussing storm cleanup. Uh, ADOT's been doing some of the same. I also would like to mention to the agencies that um, one of the issues we've been having on the state highways is we've been having to address uh, the the contractors on local development projects, whether it's been um, ADOT related or or uh, agency related, uh, those development projects, we've been seeing material getting tracked out onto the state highways. And so we've been asking the, the agencies to make sure that that their uh, development projects are, are using uh, best management practices to keep material, uh, unnecessary material off the highway. Um, I know during the heavy rains, that's hard to do, but um, we need quick cleanup and, and good maintenance from the from the development crews um, on the projects. And we do have, there There are three projects out on State Route 69 that, that you'll see that are active. Uh, the, the Maverick gas station at the corner of 69 and Country Club at Fane Road. Uh, we've been working with that developer to um, uh, get get some geometry issues corrected with the intersection before they 
you know, be before we're going to allow them to work in the state highway. Uh, we're doing the same down at 69 in Kachina, where there's a, a new development for an RV lot going in there. They're making some modifications to that uh, northeast leg of, of Kachina that will eventually tie into uh, become a, a Prescott Valley arterial. Uh, so we're, we're working on that project as well. You'll see some activity at that intersection. And we're also working with the developer down at 69 and 169. That cabin development is going in for at Prescott Valley. And uh, that's the development that we're working on coordinating with the 69-169 roundabout. So I wanted to give you those updates. They're not directly related to SIMPO, but those are activities you might see happening. Thanks, John. Okay. Uh, hey, hey, John. Yeah. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Yeah. I have a question, uh, John. Uh, appreciate your comments there. The repave SR69 in Prescott Valley, that legislative uh, uh, funding, uh, again, that was more of a state. I know I've been involved with locals that received some earmark funding. Is that uh, project, did you make comment on that one or? I did earlier. Um, I I mentioned that earlier. I I didn't. Um, I just mentioned that it that it was I I identified as a project, um, but that the limits were not uh, specified yet. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anybody I missed want to speak up with announcements? Okay, uh, next item is 14. I'll open the floor for anybody that might have any uh, requests for future agenda items. Okay, and with that, we'll move on to item 15. Uh, I'll go ahead and ask for a motion for adjournment. I'll motion adjourn. Okay, you have a motion a second. I'll second that. And all those in favor, aye. 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 Thanks all. I know. I'll always do that. Down under two hours. Yeah, finally. <laughs> so, so, uh, Good work, everyone. Trying to get, trying to get better. So, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, have a good day. Uh, hey, everybody. Next month. Yep. So. Take care. See you. See you at the retreat. See you next week. <laughs>